So now that we've established what the structure of DNA is, the evidence behind it, we can further examine the structure that's most commonly and most accurately going to depict DNA. In this next flowchart, we're going to be entitling uh, it Structure of DNA 2. We're continuing our discussion on the structure. And this is going to be subtitled Features of whose model? Whose model is most important? Watson and Crick model. So, many, many important features. Let's run through them right now. First of all, the number one feature that everybody probably already knows based off of prior knowledge is that DNA is equal to a double helix. It is a double helix. It's a double helical structure. Sort of drew it last time. We'll do a bit of a drawing. I'll try my best to illustrate a uh, very complicated and very calm, very beautiful molecule like DNA. Um, double helix simply means that, of course, it's two strands, thus why we call it double, um, so I think that's very clear. But what we mean by the idea of two strands is best sort of uh, shown when we think about one chromosome in one state and the chromosome, same chromosome in a different state. What I mean by that is if we have one unduplicated chromosome, undup chromo, that one unduplicated chromosome will have always within it two strands of DNA. It will also have, of course, proteins, histones, nucleosomes, all those things that we've talked about. But if you just imagine one chromosome that just looks sort of like this, just like this, this, one, this is one chromosome, okay, this is that centromere region, that chromosome has two strands of DNA. But what if you had one prophase chromosome? you should be able to apply the knowledge that you have about mitosis and meiosis and know that out of this one prophase chromosome you actually have two sister chromatids and if you have two sister chromatids you're going to end up with four strands of DNA. Simply speaking, I'm going to draw a sister chromatid just like this. Now I have two sister chromatids right over here and right over here I've duplicated, they're exactly the same, and thus I've duplicated the amount of strands to four strands. Just be familiar and comfortable with understanding why DNA is a double helix and not just a single helix based off of what we know about chromosomes. Moving forward, let's talk about something known as strand structure. So I'm going to do that over here. Strand structure. And I think what you can do with this part is to put this as single strand structure in parentheses. What do I mean by this? Well, first of all, if we look at just one strand of DNA, and I'm just going to draw a very rudimentary strand of DNA like this. This is simply one strand of DNA. The simplest possible way to show a strand of DNA, this is doing an injustice to DNA, but I'll explain what this means. This single strand of DNA contains a sugar phosphate backbone. Remember how we said that the components of a nucleotide include a sugar, which is deoxyribose in the case of DNA, and also a phosphate group. Sugar phosphate backbone is a certain part of this figure, which is right here. I'm going to double highlight it so that we can talk about it. This backbone consists of a sugar and a phosphate, sugar and a phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, in that pattern, in that orientation. Specifically, the sugar phosphate backbone, you can say, is on the outside of the helix, at least. It's on the outside of the helix. That's why it's on this outside portion. There's going to be another one here, but we'll talk about that later. It's on the outside. In addition, it is joined together, meaning that each sugar is connected to each phosphate together via strong, very strong, because if you want to have a, if you have a backbone, okay, this is a backbone. You want strong interactions com, uh, joining them together. The interactions specifically, and you should know this, the join together via strong. And this might be a new word for you. They're called phosphodiester linkages. Let me just squeeze that in at the bottom. There we go. Phosphodiester linkages. These are the strong linkages. They're made through condensation reactions that link together the uh, backbone. We're only talking about the backbone. Don't worry about the rungs yet. So we're going to have a sugar connected to a phosphate. Sugar, phosphate, okay? That actually looks really bad. I'm just going to take that off. A sugar with a phosphate, sugar with a phosphate. You get the deal. 
those are connected via phosphodiester linkages. Uh, a key idea between about the sugar phosphate is that there is no variability. Remember how genes are all about variation and the heredity of change? Um, there's none whatsoever in one entire part of DNA, and that is the sugar phosphate backbone, meaning that there's always going to be this arrangement of sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. You get the picture. There's no variability in this sense in the sugar phosphate backbone, the really highlighted portion that my mouse is going through. So where do we get the variability? Where do we get all these differences that we see in all of life from the smallest of amoebas to the most advanced of human beings? How do we get those differences? Where do we get variability? That variability shows up in the nitrogenous bases. So let's talk about them. Nitrogenous bases. So of course, now I'm referring to these little pokes, these little rungs of my ladder, half ladder at least, because it's only a single strand right now. Those little pokes that are coming out are the nitrogenous bases. These are considered, um, let's say, at the center of helix, whereas the sugar phosphate backbone was on the outside of helix. These are, of course, considered the rungs, as we've mentioned before. So I'm going to put that in quotes. These are the rungs of the ladder. These are attached to the backbone via covalent bonds, so we'll write that down. Attached to sugar phosphate SP backbone via covalent bonds. Strong or weak? Of course, covalent bonds are very strong. You want to make sure that these important variability things are strongly linked. You don't want them to just float away. So they are very strongly linked. Your backbone is very strong. So you so far have very strong links to connect the base. This Basically what I'm saying is if we have a sugar phosphate backbone made of phosphodiester linkages, in order for me to connect this nitrogenous base onto there, I have to undergo a condensation reaction that will create a link that's shown here. That link that I just drew is a covalent bond. So last thing about nitrogenous bases, lots of variability. I could spend days talking about how incredible that is, that all of our variability is due to the nitrogenous bases, and this is because this carries the info, carries, let's say, genetic info in sequences. That's a good DNA term, in sequences. You have sequences of A, T, C, G, C, G, C, C, A, T, T. You get the point. Those are can be variable. Those can be so varied throughout many, many different realms of biology that this is where we get all of our variation, okay? We get all this variation due to our genetic blueprint, let's say. And DNA, the blueprint, is specifically variation is due to nitrogenous bases. So again, let's make sure we understand the single strand structure that's drawn here. It's consisting of a sugar phosphate backbone, that strong part of the ladder right here, joined together via these phosphodiester linkages. No variability. The phosphate, the nitrogenous bases are then linked together right here. This is going to be strong covalent bonds that are going to provide lots of variability.